Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Aisha Subakar. It's been a thorn in the side of diplomatic ties between the U.S. and Turkey for nearly two years. An alliance once marked by mutual respect was replaced with threats and public feuds. The U.S.'s hostility centers almost entirely around Turkey's purchase of the Russian S-400 missile system. But a warm meeting between leaders of the two NATO allies in Japan last month could be signaling a shift. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan said he got assurances from his U.S. counterpart that the issue could be resolved without problems. But can President Trump, who is infamous for making statements on a whim, be trusted? Brett Klenet has more. For months, the rhetoric out of Washington was clear. If Turkey moved ahead with plans to buy a sophisticated air defense system from Russia, stinging sanctions would follow. But meeting with Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan on the sidelines of the G20 summit in Japan last month, Trump appeared to take a far more conciliatory tone. He also resorted to one of his favorite tactics. Trump put the blame squarely on his predecessor, Barack Obama. They wouldn't sell the president. They wouldn't let him, they wouldn't let him buy the missile that he wanted to buy, which was the Patriot. And then after he buys somebody else, he says, now we'll sell you the Patriot. So I have to tell you, he's a, a NATO member. He's somebody that I've become friendly with. And you have to treat people fairly. You understand that? You have to treat people fairly. <coughs> And I don't think he was treated fairly. I don't think he was treated fairly. Those comments are stark contrast to warnings from Congress, which has said it will not back down from pulling the trigger on sanctions under the Countering America's Adversaries Through Sanctions Act. It's impossible under our law if Turkey buys the, uh, activates the S-400 missile battery they bought from the Russians, sanctions would be required under law. And we also, a couple of days ago, passed legislation banning the sale of the F-35 to Turkey if they activate the Russian S-400 missile battery. Washington has already stopped training Turkish pilots in the U.S., kick-starting the process of expelling Ankara from the Pentagon's F-35 fighter jet program. It claims the ground-to-air missiles are incompatible with NATO defenses and that the move threatens the F-35 fighter jets, which Turkey buys. Ankara, for its part, hasn't wavered in its plans to have the Russian-made S-400s delivered by this month. Speaking to Turkish broadcaster NTV, Erdogan sounded confident that Trump would withhold from slapping sanctions on Turkey. He quoted Trump saying, you are right, this is injustice. This is very important. I believe that we will overcome this process without any problems. We've been fighting for a long time in Syria. But Trump has made off the cuff promises before, including his pledge back in December to begin a rapid U.S. withdrawal from Syria. Nearly eight months later, U.S. troops remain. That's raising questions over whether Trump's softer stance is here to stay and whether the White House has the power to protect it from economic penalties. But also at stake is the already delicate relationship between Ankara and Washington. And with Trump's comments at the G20 still open to interpretation, it appears ties between the two NATO allies continue to hang in the balance. Britt Klenet, Straight Talk. And joining me now is Sinan Ulgen, who is a former Turkish diplomat and a visiting scholar at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and John Bolas, who is a lecturer of political science and international relations at MEF University here in Istanbul. Gentlemen, welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to have you here, John. I want to start with you. I mean, Trump adopted a conciliatory tone and put the blame on the Obama administration for this dispute. He also said they'll hopefully overcome this problem in which Turkey was treated unfairly. And on the other hand, President Erdogan said he hoped there would be no sanctions on Turkey. So given the latest statements of the two presidents, where does this dispute go? Well, it's difficult to say. I mean, I, you know, on, on some level, I think Trump viscerally feels that way. Uh, he, he, you know, he, I think he, you know, is compassionately empathetic to some extent about Turkey's predicament at this point. 
Uh, and his favorite line whenever he wants to get out of something is, of course, to blame his predecessor, Barack Obama, or even better, Hillary Clinton would be, would be a better choice. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it, in the end, this is all just kind of nice words. We've seen this story play out uh, before. Uh, you know, they have good meetings. There's clearly a good rapport between the two men, the two leaders. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, reality, I mean, we even saw a report today that the U.S. again intends to continue to go S forth. On Senate. Senator Lindsey Graham said he doesn't want a conflict with Turkey over S 400s and he hinted there could be a way out of this dispute if Turkey did not activate S-400s and instead buy Patriot's uh, NATO-compliant missile system. What do you make of that? Well, I'm a bit confused. I, it, I did indeed read uh, Senator's statement. In uh, a couple of places, he does use the terminology activate, but in one sentence, he uses buy. So I'm not really clear whether that terminology uh, that he uses is fully aware of the implications. But if he is, and if he's, he's actually meaning activation, that could indeed provide for some uh, diplomat diplomatic maneuvering space because so, far, uh, because so far now the threshold for the Katsa sanctions mm -hmm. until now was essentially defined as the delivery of the uh, material to yeah. Turkey. Now, if Congress starts to interpret the threshold for the triggering of sanctions as the activation of that material, that's a different threshold. So there will therefore be a few more months ahead of us before the sanctions are triggered. And therefore... But it's just going to be a postponement? Well, I mean, then Turkey will need to decide uh, whether after buying the equipment, whether it wants to operationalize it. But I suppose in a, you know, in a democratic uh, society, it's difficult to justify, you know, buying, you know, $1.5 million worth of uh, military material and not using it. Mm -hmm. So therefore, even if theoretically that provides some, you know, diplomatic space for Turkey, uh, practically, uh, it may uh, also be quite difficult for Turkey to buy it and not use it. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uh, Senator uh, Graham's statements uh, may not actually give uh, you know, the type of uh, diplomatic uh, space mm -hmm. or formula uh, that we could seize. John, what do you make of that? I mean, is there any significance to his wording? Well, there would be, as, as, uh, as Sinan uh, points out. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, the law does not say that. The cats of sanctions kick in when they acquire uh, mm -hmm. rather than activate. So, I mean, if, if it truly is activate, yeah, that buys us more time. We've had two years. Let's, let's extend it longer. I, 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 that sounds like good news to me. Okay. And Washington has also formally started the process of expelling uh, Turkey from the uh, F-35 program. Uh, how this decision will affect uh, Turkey militarily and financially? Well, the financial side is obvious in the sense that uh, there are, uh, I think, five uh, Turkish companies uh, that are involved in the production line of the F-35 mm -hmm. uh, with a total portfolio amounting to $12 billion. Mm -hmm. uh, so that will disappear if Turkey is excluded from the F-35 program. And just to put things in perspective, I think it's uh, worth underlining that uh, the uh, Turkey's burgeoning defense industry, uh, the yearly exports are about $2 billion. Okay. So this amounts to six times yearly exports of, of, the... of all the you know, uh, companies in the defense, in the Turkish defense industry. So in that sense, it's quite a sizable uh, mm -hmm. amount. That's the financial side. Uh, now, on the, uh, the more military side, uh, it perhaps goes beyond you know, what we can discuss here at this panel, but uh, very shortly, the Earth 35 is actually not just a plane. It's actually a flying information manager. Mm -hmm. And they, they, it is going to be at the epicenter of how wars are uh, fought in the future, because it's all about you know, uh, connectivity, and this is the plane that will connect ground elements to, see, uh, to satellites, uh, mm -hmm. to, you know, to troops themselves. It has that sort of functionality. And that's why it's, you know, it's not uh, a, a fighter plane that's easy to replace. Had that been a problem with the F-16, for instance, mm -hmm. we could easily find a replacement. But the F-35 is of a very different nature. So, uh, John, do you believe Turkey has alternatives? Um, because Moscow offers Ankara a share in developing the next generation S-500s. Uh, what do you make of that? 
Uh, well, I mean, Moscow is obviously making a play here uh, to divide Turkey and the United States uh, by offering the, the S-400s and, you know, tempting them with further development. Um, you know, they, it, they publicly state that uh, they will include the technology transfer with the S-400s. Uh, mm -hmm. So this sounds like a better deal for Turkey. Whether that actually happens remains to be seen. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I mean, Turkey, you know, historically has had to play these two powers off of one so another. So is this, I mean, S-400 deal a triumph for Russian President Vladimir Putin? Is he the ultimate winner of this dispute? Well, certainly. I mean, on some level, he, he has gained politically. Uh, you can't dispute that uh, by, by, by causing a fissure here, a major fissure potentially. Uh, but there's still plenty of time, of course, to, to, to unwind it. So uh, do you believe, uh, Sinan, that Trump and Erdogan are trying their best to avoid uh, this dispute turning into a chaos in bilateral relations? And do you believe there are more diplomatic channels to be exploited in the coming future? Because, I mean, we're expecting uh, the deliveries of uh, S-400 very shortly. Well, I'm try I, I mean, looking at Osaka at the meeting that you've reported on, uh, it certainly seems that way. Uh, that, you know, uh, Trump was almost reading uh, from the talking points of President Erdogan. So in that sense, you know, he seems to be very inclined uh, to find a solution, a diplomatic solution, that won't hurt the relationship. But having said that, uh, we also have difficulty in seeing how we can orchestrate that, mm -hmm. in the sense that the U.S. president has some prerogatives, but at the end of the day, uh, there are, you know, a, a set of legal rules in the U.S. There's the separation of powers. There's the position of Congress. And therefore, within that, can he actually operate? Does he have enough political space and willingness going mm -hmm. forward uh, to really do what's necessary uh, for a crisis-free scenario? Yeah, so July is going to be a very Surely. hectic month, both for Turkey and the United States. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me on Straight Talk. Appreciate it a lot. It's been called one of Asia's longest running conflicts for a good reason. Five decades of fighting and more than 100,000 dead. But now the Philippine government is betting things will change for the country's Muslim minority. Manila has invested heavily in a peace plan which includes regional autonomy for the country's 5 million Moro people. But if history is any guide, any peace plan has to tackle an issue that has haunted past attempts how to disarm thousands of fighters and integrate them into society. John Hasasu went to Cotabato on the island of Mindanao to see that process firsthand. Beyond this river lies the territory of the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. These Moro fighters are taking us to their stronghold, known to the locals as Camp Bedr. While things may seem calm now, for decades this area was a war zone. Having thought of every foreign invader since the days of Spanish colonial rule, the Moros have built a feared reputation of resisting outsiders. That even applied to the authorities in Manila, a thousand kilometers away. After five decades of fighting and more than 100,000 dead, the Philippine government is looking not to repeat past mistakes. And after a series of peace talks and a recent landmark referendum, the process of establishing an autonomous region called Bangsamoro is gaining steam. But to have any sort of lasting peace, the situation on the ground needs to improve. For Nuri Ali Ibrahim, who lost a brother in the fighting, that's the most crucial thing. What we want is peace. It seems that the war is over. We want to live in a peaceful community where we can get on with our work. Our children need a proper education so they can get proper jobs. But for that to happen, the region's insurgents have to be disarmed. Finding ways to do that has haunted past attempts at lasting peace. These are fighters with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. They were born during the five-decade-long war. 
But now they will be among an estimated 30,000 fighters who will give up their weapons. Some of them will apply for the new security forces set up in a peace agreement for the region. But for most of them, providing for their families is going to be the next battle. To keep the peace, the MILF chairman and the chief minister of the Bansomoro regional government, Al Haj Murad Ibrahim, travels frequently to the capital Manila. It was during one of these trips that we had the chance to ask about his hopes for the future. So, you know, we need to rebuild and we need to promote the uh, economy. Uh, we need to uh, open opportunities for people to to have a good life and uh, also we are inviting foreign investors economically untapped due to decades of conflict the philippine government is optimistic that the bangsamoro autonomous region will be able to create an economy that can absorb thousands of former rebels agriculture and tourism are sectors high on the list for local officials. Actually, not only farming relying on the developing our income in the Bangsamoro areas. Uh, we, uh, the, the Bangsamoro government, uh, going to develop the fishing uh, activities as source of our income, especially on the uh, tuna and other fish that uh, like uh, shrimp and others uh, very uh, potential in our area. And Bangsamoro's tropical beauty could become a new realm for tourism. The rebel returnees and the combatants, how are, how are we going to accommodate them in our society? Actually, Muslim Mindanao is actually very rich when it comes to natural resources and natural endowment. So uh, oh, the only thing that we need to do is really to tap them. Camp Abu Bakr as Siddiq wants a safe haven for insurgents battling the Philippine military is now looking to attract holidayers searching for the perfect getaway. If all goes to plan, many former rebels will be providing security in the area instead of battling the government. John Hasasu, Straight Talk. And joining me now is Kadir Temis, who is an assistant professor of political science at Istanbul Shahir University, and Rizal Buendia, who is a political analyst and former chief of the political science department of De La Salle University, based in Manila. Gentlemen, welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to have you here. Rizal, I want to start with you. What does this agreement mean both for Mora Muslims and the central government? Well, this... Uh, uh this agreement is a really a, an amazing agreement, but uh, I think uh, we really have to uh, examine that uh, there were, or, or there are, uh, two peace agreements uh, that is existing. One between the Philippine government and the Moro National Liberation Front, and the more recent one, uh, the Philippine government and the MILF. Mm -hmm. And there is no integration of, uh, of these two peace agreements. In fact, uh, the, uh, the, the Moros are still divided and, 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 uh, and are in conflict. So are uh, these two agreements going to be integrated? Uh, there's no, uh, there's no um, uh, policy that has been articulated by the government that there is a need to integrate these two peace agreements. But the problem is uh, there is a rivalry among ethnic groups in, in among... Uh, among the Moros. I'm, I'm going to uh, get into that in a bit later, but there are lots of difficulties lie ahead, like the disarmament of rebels, maybe. Um, what do you think, Kadir? What is the risk of former MILF members joining terrorist groups affiliated to Al Qaeda and like Abu Sayyaf? Yes, uh, there's a very important drawbacks actually uh, for the agreement uh, because the unity among the, these different fractions. Uh, will uh, affect the current and the future development or the implementation of the agreement. For example, the MILF and the MNLF, the Moro National Liberation Front and the Moro exactly. Islamic Liberation Front, has uh, some uh, problem uh, from the history, and they even fight at each other. Mm -hmm. And so the Philippine state has different two agreements, as Professor told about it. 
And so the problem here, how the MILF will disarm uh, these people, especially fighting inside the MILF, and of course the other factions, and how they will get integrated to this uh, how will agreement. How they be integrated? And probably they will discuss it through uh, the process, but it depends on the government's success. Nowadays we will see the implementation of the agreement, especially we will uh, observe the economic development and administrative success. So the ball the, is uh, in the government's Yes, court? in the hand of the Ibrahim, especially chief minister mm -hmm. of uh, the Bangsamoro uh, government nowadays. Mm -hmm. Rizal, is the Philippines public accepting Accepting this agreement because in the referendum they, I mean, 85 percent voted yes uh, for this agreement. What do you? Yeah, take actually, on that? Uh, about 88 percent of okay. uh, of uh, of the people voted for the uh, for the agreement. But uh, most of uh, most of the people who voted for the agreement are basically concentrated in Mindanao. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, there are some politicians in up north and likewise. Uh, some politicians, even in Mindanao, because Mindanao is composed of 25 provinces and only five provinces are mostly, uh, mostly uh, Muslim uh, dominated. And the, and the, and the uh, referendum uh, was conducted in the five major uh, mm -hmm. Muslim dominated provinces. And that's the reason why you have, uh, uh, you have 88% uh, actually uh, voted for uh, yeah. the, the agreement. But I, I think uh, I have to, uh, 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 mentioned that Sulu, 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 yes. Sulu actually uh, rejected the the uh, the the, the, uh, the Bangsamoro organic law mm -hmm. because Sulu is fundamentally uh, Tausug and Tausug is uh, the the ethnic group of Nur Miswari of the mm -hmm. of the MNLF. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, uh, since uh, 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 Sulu, even if Sulu rejected uh, the the uh, the uh, the uh, Bangsamoro organic law, they still part of uh, the uh, of the of the Bangsamoro. Yeah. So we cannot talk region. about a 100 yeah. percent reconciliation between the uh, fighting sides. Let's say we all know that this re the region is underdeveloped. Uh, yeah. Kadir, how will this agreement impact the social? economic plight of Muslims since we saw in the package the region can be a rich agricultural uh, area and a tourism hotspot. Um, Is that even possible given yeah, the current circumstances? Yes, of course. And every time economy or the money talks uh, for the first time and then people talk about the political and social events and the economically Muslims actually is coming from the trade uh, experience and the, historically they are making trades in all over the Southeast Asian uh, countries so they are powerfully making trades so probably and uh, they will get some foreign uh, investors from the other countries especially the Malaysia and the close regions to develop their skills mm -hmm. and maybe production skills and they will probably in the future will develop or will establish new companies and new factories uh, to increase their production inside the Montsomoro autonomous region mm -hmm. so this kind of success will determine the future of the agreement actually if they can find a way to deal with these problems and probably and all of the political and other factors will uh, be get a part of this solution. Yeah. How about Turkey's role result? Turkey has played a valuable role in mediating between Mora and the central government. Uh, they have also provided extensive humanitarian aid during that period. So how crucial was this role and what can Turkey uh, how play a role in the future if this agreement is to succeed? Actually, uh, Turkey uh, is performing an amazing job in conflict resolution. In fact, uh, the head of the international, uh, uh, the head of the independent uh, decommissioning body is headed by a, um, a, uh, uh, the ambassador of, uh, of Turkey yes. to the Philippines. And, uh, and the, 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 the commissioning process is a fundamental task in, uh, in addressing the problem of, uh, of armed conflict. And, uh, and I think uh, because of this, uh, Turkey has performed a lot of uh, fundamental uh, activities. Is Turkey welcome there? Definitely, Turkey is uh, welcome in the, in the Philippines, as well as there are a lot of uh, non-governmental organizations that's working 
uh, in, uh, in, in confidence building measures mm -hmm. no? and uh, likewise in, uh, in providing socioeconomic uh, uh, reforms uh, and, and programs and projects for the uh, poverty stricken uh, communities in, the, in, the, uh, in, in Mindanao. Okay, gentlemen, thank you for joining me on Straight Talk. I appreciate it a lot. And that's all for this edition of Straight Talk with me, Aisha Subakash. If you've got any comments, do share them with us on Twitter with hashtag Straight Talk. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until next time, take care and goodbye. <music>